if you think about how things work today and what's really driving both retail and industrial, it's they're remaking their supply chains to be incredibly more efficient. So the goal with e-commerce, we have 8 to 10% of our gross sales today are in e-commerce. That'll probably be over 30% within three to five years. So how do you do it with the goal that if you go online and order something at 8 o'clock in the morning, how is it going to be at your door at 8 o'clock at night? And so uh, we have this little thing called Panama Canal expansion. We have ports on the East Coast that we're hearing discussions about are going to participate and, and maybe do more than the West Coast ports. What's all that about? Um, over the next two years, what we understand and do in retail and industrial is going to be turned completely upside down. And so I think one of the things we'll discuss today is the sense of urgency. What you do over the next 12 months will dictate the degree that you participate in that 24 to 36 months from now for probably the next decade or two decades. So very important to pay attention to it. And the, the graphic I use on the left over there, or your right, is really it's a relay race. Think about your river, think about all the things that you're doing when you do an assessment of your economy here, and think about what segments of the relay race in retail, industrial, manufacturing, you're going to run and focus on those. Don't try to be one thing or think that one thing will do it all. Think about your relay segment and run it very well. So, um, you know, I recently spoke in Birmingham and in Memphis, and I call it kind of the Eeyore concept. You know, everybody's heads are kind of down. They hadn't had anybody come talk to them about what's really great about their city and their economy in a long time. Um, you know, you think about your region and some of the things that you've been through going back through you know, the auto industry and, you know, everything that's gone on through the financial crisis and whatnot, and you kind of feel down a little bit and down and out. So I'm going to try to bring you up a little bit. So if I asked you in the audience, without looking up here, to name just two or three things that the St. Louis economy would rank in the top 10 or 20, let's say top 25, how many of you could immediately come to mind with two items that St. Louis would rank tops on any kind of economic metric in the country? See, that's a problem. That's part of your psychology that we'll talk about today is that you have to do a reassessment of your strengths and your weaknesses. And your strengths are tremendous. And if you don't have the psychology of your own strengths, how are you going to convince others to come here and put, put that activity, that economic activity here? So I'm going to start at the top. So Julie, this one's just for you. Um, how many of you realize that, and you should, this is your home, um, that there is only one state in the union that has two Federal Reserve District Banks? Missouri, right? And so how many of you realize that right now you're the only state with two Fed presidents from your state that are voting on the Federal Open Market Committee? Both Esther George from Kansas City and Jim Bowler just rotated on. Um, these are incredible, you, know, you talk about the youth, the, the vigor, the ideas, the strength that really fought for the community bank system. Um, you know, when we were going through Dodd-Frank, the governors and folks in Washington wanted to throw the community banks off to the side. And it was the Fed presidents and people like out of St. Louis and Kansas City and Dallas that stood up and said, you know what, we're not going to surrender our community bank system. It's incredibly important to our communities. So to have two people in that position, and how important are financial uh, type of jobs in the financial industry to your community here. Tremendous. A.G. Edwards, think go right down through the line of the financial community here. You're one of probably the few really well-functioning, we call traditional fire markets, finance, insurance, real estate. So you have a very, you, know, you look at Atlanta, you look at Charlotte, banking industry is decimated, right? You look at your financial services industry, very strong assessment. And when you look at what the banking industry is going through to have to become more cost efficient, Right? You think they're going to continue to put all these operations in New York and San Francisco and Boston, where it's really expensive, the labor, the real estate. They're looking at affordability options. And so here's another strength. You've got affordability option, and you've already got a strength in establishment. And then when you talk about those industries saying, well, you know, we're going to be doing a lot of crazy and innovative things, and we might want to run them by the Fed before we do it. Well, if I'm in a state that has two Fed districts <laughs> and two voting FOMC members, a pretty good place to be. So a lot of strengths on the finance side. So that's number one. Number two I got up there, how many of you would have known this morning that you guys rank in the top, so I'll do 20 plus one, so we'll just um, put a new headline, but you rank almost in the top 20 in job growth for last year. Does that blow your mind? It should. I mean, it's, but now if you ask to go outside the country and ask how many of them would predict or, or identify St. Louis as being in the top 20 in job growth in the country, how many do you think would raise their hands in New York, San Francisco, Boston, Florida, Atlanta, or even go over to Europe? 
And the com companies that are looking at moving operations to the United States would even have St. Louis on their radar screen. That's an incredible story. And these aren't low-wage type of jobs like down in Memphis that are moving a lot of intermodal and warehousing and type stuff. These are good office-paying jobs, financial service, average $80,000, $90,000, dollars a year jobs, which you want in your economy. Down here, one of my favorite housing indicators. So we all get dizzy every month of trying to figure out whether housing's in recovery. So we hear the Case-Shiller Index, right? And we have the FHFA, and then we hear NAR, and the home builders release existing home sales and non-existing home sales and um, everything. We get all these metrics, and two go up and three go down, but we're told it's okay. Well, forget them all. Pay attention to one index. The National Association of Home Builders, um, here we go, right here, has this improved markets index. They created it in 2008 because they said when the market went to hell, at some point we'll need to convince people that markets are coming back. So we're going to create this index, this robust index of about eight metrics to capture home prices, foreclosures, job creation, all the things that go into housing. And we're going to try to identify what markets are truly improving. Well, 2008, no markets made it. 2009, no markets made it. 2010, no markets made it. They're ready to dissolve the index. 2011, a few more markets made it. 2012, first part of the year, a few made it. What would you guess is the number of markets? So we have about 360 MSAs in the country. How many of those, percentage or rough number, do you think made that improved housing market index? And to be on that index, they had to have positive job creation, declining foreclosure activity, rising home price appreciation, and positive on five other metrics. How many MSAs do you think made that list at the end of last year? 50? Okay, 100? 150? Two? <laughs> 201. If you don't think this housing recovery is real, you're sorely mistaken. And I'll show you exactly how broad-based it is. So imagine on all those metrics, so it's not just on one little thing like on home price appreciation, which you can play a lot of games with based on what's for sale or what wasn't for sale. This is a real robust one. And it factors all of those things into one index. So it's very real. The other one I've got up here is in terms of um, on the Numbers Economic Index. So Tim Logan in the back should know about this. So how many of you ever heard of On the Numbers Economic Index? Great, <laughs> our research folks. Um, it was created by America's business journals. So all the business journals around the country get together, and they know their grassroots what's happening. And once a month, they rank the top 102 MSAs in the country on economic performance, activity, and measures. And you guys rank top 25 plus one. So when you start seeing, it's not just one thing, whether it's housing, whether it's job creation, look at all the things that you guys are in the top 20, 25 on. But how many people outside of here in industry realize that? A lot of the students at Washington University, I think if you talk to them, they don't want to leave. They'd love to have the jobs and probably stay here. Um, so this is part of the story. Now, one that you don't, we'll talk about, is this is the uh, this report that goes to Congress every year on foreign trade zones, and it looks at who are the top import and export places and what's going on? How many of you be shocked to see the number one in both imports and exports is Texas? It's not California. It's not Florida. You guys don't make the list here, not in the top 20. So here's the opportunity. Here's where you guys rank, down here in 25. So what I just told you, and think of the skill, the education, the technology, the financial resources, all the things that you have going for you, what happens is you move a lot of raw commodities through here, and you don't get them to stop and be processed and manufactured and value added to those goods. That's your opportunity. And if you want to look at an example, somebody that's, that's doing that in a big way, look at, for example, um, Memphis with what they've done. Memphis has now become the number one air cargo um, port globally. It surpassed everything in Europe, everything in Asia, it moves more cargo. And it's more than just Federal Express. Louisville, Kentucky has the UPS there. Indianapolis is moving to put a major intermodal system that'll connect uh, Port Rupert in Canada down into here. Why do you think there's so much intermodal activity going on around Illinois? The cluster in distribution in the United States is Chicago. It takes 27 hours to move a freight train from one side of Chicago to the other because we had this really great idea. See, in Europe, they move everything, they move passengers by rail and no cargo. They put it on an airplane, the most expensive way you can do it. In the United States, we move everything, right, by passengers by the air and put everything on the freight train. Well, in Chicago, they said, no, nah, we're going to have a new green plan. We're going to put all of the passengers on the freight traffic and destroy what made our city great. 
So they put all the passenger rail traffic on the freight traffic, and the freight traffic has to yield to the passenger traffic. It's a $300 billion, 10-year solution in the most financially wrecked state in the union, worse than California. You think they're going to fix it? Industry isn't going to wait around. So they're looking for options. They're looking at Memphis. They're looking at Indianapolis. You guys ought to be on that radar screen. You ought to be up there. So this is part of the opportunity we'll talk about. The other one to look at, there's a data source called Dodge Pipeline. They track everything that's under construction, everything that's planned. And one of the things I do when I look at the industrials, I look at where are all the new modern distribution and logistics centers being built. They're not being built here. So this is where the fulfillment centers and all those opportunities could exist. And so you can look at where they all are. You have one 50,000 square, 56,000 square foot Coca-Cola distribution facility going on. You're missing the opportunity, given all the resources that you have here. All right, here's the other thing um, in terms of talking about, let's look at intermodal. You have six railroads that intersect here. Tremendous intermodal, intermodal linkage. What's gonna happen with the ports is we now, the stuff that comes into the ports isn't gonna stay there very long. It's gonna be moved in interior. And we're seeing manufacturing returning to the United States for patent protection, currency advantage, appreciation of the Fed, They've made it a, the most affordable place to manufacture with currency. And our, and our infrastructure, whether it's electric grids, utilities, availability of energy, rail, interstate, education, talent, engineers, IT people, we have all of that. And so intermodal, I've redefined it, is industrial now turns especially to rail to move ocean distribution across land. That's intermodal. And you guys are right at the, at the key part of that. And if you don't think about who is your port partner, you're going to miss out. So for example, Columbus, Ohio. Anybody been to Columbus recently? Columbus has partnered a long time ago with the Port of Norfolk, Virginia. And the Limited has its grassroots in Columbus, Ohio. So it brings all of its raw textile goods in through Norfolk and air cargoes them into Columbus, where they do all the final refining and cutting and the designs that go just in time to the merchants over the different seasons. And so Columbus has partnered and has one of the best, fastest growing um, air cargo and distribution in the textile industry. Who is your port partner? Who is going to be St. Louis's port partner to connect all of what you have going here? I'll, I'll throw one suggestion out we'll talk about. Port of Mobile. Mobile, Alabama will be one of only two post Panamax, it means more than 50 feet deep, ports in the entire Gulf Coast. Tampa's not going to be it. Miami is going to be it, but it'll probably be handling too many other things to grow much. Houston already is congested and still has to dredge. And Alabama and Tennessee are fighting each other over all economic activity that they're probably missing the opportunity, and that's an opportunity for you. You need a port partner. So um, there's the Memphis story. So look at that. Um, here's, uh, I publish, we publish each quarter a, a North American Industrial and Office Outlook. This is our current one. And a couple things that I want to point out. The importance of intermodal and having your port partner. And the other one is inland waterways are diminishing in importance. In an e-commerce era, we don't have the time to float things down rivers. It's a relay race. There are going to be parts of it that are very valuable like you have here. But you go further down like to Memphis, right, and the water levels and everything else become much more complicated to move cargo. But you have a different situation here. So you might be that one part of the waterway relay race that you run really well, but then when it gets off here, are you just gonna let all that leave? Or are you gonna try to process it and create value in jobs here? And so the analogy that we use right now in our current one is geese flying in a V formation. So here, who has any military experience or um, been a hunter? Okay, nobody wants to admit it. We're all supposed to be green and, and not shoot at geese and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> so geese, and Julie, we did this one time before. I almost got in trouble with public affairs there, didn't I? Um, I won't tell them what my real green theory is. But anyway, geese fly in a V formation because it's 50% more efficient. They use 50% less energy. And that's really what's happening here with retail and industrial. The whole supply chain is trying to figure out how can we do 50% more at half the cost of transportation. That's what's really going on here. That's how you got to think about your role here. This is a, a link to the ports report we did last summer. We have a new one coming out in about two weeks. Um, we cover everything. Here is a graphic of South Carolina that I want you to think about. Here's the port of Charleston. And all these red dots and the size of them represent the entities that import, export, or use the port. You don't need to have a port to have a lot of economic activity. It all is inland. It's near where there's water for manufacturing. It's near where there's skilled labor. Here up here, you have the Greenville-Spartanburg area. 
And the Port of Charleston has figured this out following a cue from Norfolk. They're developing an inland port in Greer, South Carolina. The historic city of Charleston doesn't want any more port activity. So they said, how can we grow as a port? We'll put it all inland. We'll do all the assemblage, all the work, all of the cargo handling, all the annoying stuff. We'll do it here and we'll roll on, roll off to the port and we'll be in and out in eight hours of the night and you never see us there. But this is what the opportunity, you do the same thing for Tennessee and you look at your cells, you can have all the activity and with your rail connections and the intermodal, you can do so much more. That's your opportunity. So uh, one other perspective, and we'll wrap up here, is on office. So let's look at the other side of it. So I mentioned you have a very vital fire market, finance, insurance, real estate. Well, the other side that we define is what we call IC. So about two years ago, we began to see a bifurcation in absorption and transaction activity and performance in the office markets. And they had nothing to do with the fire, finance, insurance, or real estate. So we said, what's going on here? What are the common elements? And we found it was technology, energy, and education. So the IC part is intellectual capital, or technology, and the E's are energy and education. And what we're finding is over the last two years, the absorption pace in IC markets with a composition of technology, energy, or education, one or all of them, is double that of fire markets, double. And you have both pieces. You're both an IC market and a fire market that's performing. There may be only be three examples of that in the country. How many people would know that in the country or outside the US? It's a tremendous story there. And you look at, look at the markets that were tops in absorption. Who was tops in absorption, office absorption for last year? Detroit. Any of you predict that over the last 20 years? This stuff is very achievable. I'll give you another example to talk about. If you look at where Denver, Colorado was 30 years ago, I grew up in Denver, and I went to Atlanta to go to business school, and where Atlanta was 30 years ago, and you look at the two cities today, complete role reversals. Atlanta was where you wanted to go, it had everything new, it had all the infrastructure, every Fortune 500 company wanted to relocate there, right? 30 years later, we're a congested heart attack that everybody wants to get the hell out of. <laughs> And you go to Denver. It's completely reinvented itself from a sleepy little federal and state government military town to probably one of the most vital IC markets in the country. New infrastructure, new rail, new public transportation. Everybody wants in there. These things can happen relatively quickly. Think of that in just 30 years. Complete transformation. Um, so I'll conclude. Here's the numbers on the IC numbers and absorption. So this is something that has not happened since World War II. The top five markets for office absorption last year did not include a New York, a Washington DC, a Los Angeles, a San Francisco. Does that blow your mind? And Atlanta's becoming more of an IC market, technology. We've lost all of our manufacturing. We're now becoming automotive technology engineering. We don't manufacture Ford and GM or anything anymore. Dallas has become more of an IC technology market than it is an energy market. Uh, used in the same way with the medical centers and all of those type things. Um, so these are, these are kind of what the IC, some of the IC markets look like. And Julie knows I'm a big book proponent in a picture's worth a thousand words, but I still like to give a thousand or ten thousand words. Um, so this is a building that burned in January in Chicago. So see, Chicago's in a lot of trouble. And so the fire put it out, and then by the morning, ICE had taken over. So if you don't believe that IC is overtaking fire, here's proof picture that ICE is overtaking fire. Um, so that's where I'll wrap up um, there, and we'll move right on. How'd I do on time?